Howdy hackers and welcome to another episode of Fairlight TV. It's been a long time since the last episode, sorry about that. I am changing houses, which means that we are preparing for the real estate agent and, and uh, showings and uh, marketing or that. It takes a humongous amount of, of time preparing the houses, cleansing the uh, wardrobes and, and what have you not. So sorry about that. But I found a bit of time to do a bit of work uh for showing you something that you might be interested in i'm showing you one of my sort of secret tools and if you ask nicely you might even get access to it so over to that all right let's swap over to this uh, given that I was out traveling, uh, I was in Spain, uh, and I should show you this. I'm still wearing it. This is the Computer Game Museum in uh, Malaga. Uh, they had a number of very kind of obsolete hardware, but also very current hardware. They did have C64s, they did have Amiga, and what did I find on the Amiga? They were running one game. It was Sensible Soccer. And which version? They were running the Fairlight version of it. So, Torsten, please show the picture of me in the uh, computer museum in Malaga. Uh, and in front of me, or, or behind me, there was this Amiga running a Fairlight Amiga intro. Okay, so on the Spanish south coast, uh, you could go for holidays because it's it's very warm. It's very close to the to the ocean, and uh, yeah, it, it's a very nice place. And uh, it seems that a few of the places attract uh, certain nationalities, and one of the places that attract Brits is uh, Te Torremolinos. Uh, which made me very interested in finding the old game that I thought was called Torre Molinos. Um, well, first of all, I should say I'm not British, but I was passing there and, and the signs were pointing in that direction. But I realized the, the C64 game, which is also released in a number of other platforms, is called Terror Molinos. So the purpose of this game is that you should, it's an adventure game, it, it's sort of text-based, but at certain points in the progress of the game, you should use your camera to take a photo. When you take a photo, it's showing you the photo, because it's sort of, it, and these are generated photos. If you played uh, games like The Hobbit, um, the game is drawing the the graphics uh, for that uh, particular thing. And this is sort of what happens here. So it can generate 10 different images. And, and your job in this game is to identify the 10 locations inside the game where you should issue the command, uh, take photo. Uh, the only issue here that you can see on the screen is you have picture taken and successful picture taken. Uh, so, picture taken here, the counter is zero, and the successful picture is also zero. When you have taken a number of photos, you will have sort of, when you are exploring the games, you will take photos in locations where you're not supposed to. They are not counted as successful ones. And when you run out of pictures in your role, uh, the game is ending because uh, you need to ensure that you preserve your pictures and only take photos where they are successful. 
Uh, so my ambition here was to see if I could add a trainer to this, because nobody has trained this game. Sort of updating the logics of the game from, uh, from a role-based camera to a digital camera, where, which always has infinite pictures. You can take as many as you want, and you never run out of film. I, I realize the game is written in, in a tool called the Quill. Um, and to be honest, it's rather complex. And I dug around and dug around and dug around. And of course, I could find the counter for this. So picture taken, I could see that, um, that it increased on the screen. I can see where it sort of uh, picked, so, uh, how it increased. But I never really found where it fetched. Uh, the value um, that was eventually printed there in picture uh, pics taken. Uh, so I decided that this was time to bring about one of my old tools. Um, and I will show you how that works. Okay, I had a snapshot of a uh, position a bit into the game where I can actually use the camera, but um, yeah, well, I, I can't use that because it doesn't work on this instance of ice. So I'm just explaining how I'm doing things. So when a game is running, uh, a number of things change inside the memory. Things are copied around, and when you execute stuff, it stores temporary values. And, and so it's, it's fully natural when you watch the memory of uh, running computer programs to have a number of things changing. Uh, but what if you want to capture a certain change? Not any change. It, if you have lots of things changing, and you have, like, you take a snapshot, you wait a bit and then you take another snapshot, you would have that that change that you are looking for is hidden amongst a number of other, other changes. Uh, so I was thinking and thinking and thinking of this and, uh, uh, and I came to the conclusion that if I take a number of snapshots uh, when the game is running and I haven't done what I wanted to test, Let's say I take three of them. So I have three snapshots. I haven't changed what I wanted to, to actually validate. Anything that is different between all these three wouldn't be relevant because that wouldn't be the change I was looking for. Then I make my change. Let's say I decrease a life or in the instance of Terror, Terror Molinos is I take a photo. And then I make three new snapshots with a, a few seconds between. So any change between the last three would also not be relevant because the, these are things that change when the program is running. I don't need to worry about those. So I isolate the areas in the first block of three that are um, consistent over the three. These are values that could be relevant. And then I do the same with the second block and isolate the areas that are the same across all three of them. And then I compare those, the result of the first comparison with the result of the second comparison. And then I look for places different between those two comparisons. Uh, let's see here. So. I am here now and I do a save and, and um, that's temp 1a and then I save it to device 0. I always use to save to from zero address 2 and then I do to save to FFF. FFFF. Why do I save from address 2? Yeah, because if I, if I have a look on, on the dump I'm doing and I'm using some other tool that can do a hex dump, it's really convenient that the offset of the file is the same as it would be in the memory. So if I take uh, Total Commander, which is sort of my go-to tool for, for file editing, and I'm looking at the file in the hex viewer of that one, the addresses I see in hex would be the same as the address in the C64 memory. 
the the file contains two starting bytes because it's a PRG file, which is the start address. So the first two bytes would be zero. And if I know that and just sort of not worry about them and just worry about the, the rest, I have the benefit that the offset of the file is the C64 native address. So this is how I do it. And then I go into the game again um, and I wouldn't touch the number of pictures taken and then I enter the game again and then I'm saving something which is like temp1b going into the game playing around a bit more and then going into the game again and and I can save any number of, of um, snapshots here it wouldn't really matter my, my program can handle anything from two to basically like an infinite number all right, and then I do the um, then I then I take a picture using the camera of this game, or I'm losing a life in in another game, or whatever I would like to change to see if how that changes. So let's let's just assume that I've taken a photo, and as you can see on the screen, um, I cannot take a photo because I'm so early in the game. I don't even have a camera, uh, and then I go into here and I save. 2a because i'm now and I'm, I'm using two just to indicate that i'm actually after the instance i would like to validate go into the game play around a bit more and then i do temp to b there we go so now i have enough material to run my program and we should see how i then use my program Okay, so just showing you how this works. CMD here, and I can do, oh, yeah, you should see this one here. Uh, so this is what I have. Um, type run.bat, uh, so that I don't need to kind of type the actual command. <laughs> I store the command with the the switches i'm adding to it uh, inside the bat file and then i run the bat file yeah call me lazy i i am so what this is dump diff is the comp the name of it uh, i feed in configure one and then configure two and the first one data one dot txt that is a list of the programs the c64 programs the snapshot before for the change and then conf2 points to another file which is data2.txt and that contains or that lists the files that are the snapshots after the difference okay so um yeah i can type uh, data1.txt just to show you that one um uh, you might want to see it a bit bigger so this should be more visible to you here you see uh, total 1a dot prg total 1b dot prg so that is the first the data one so these are the two snapshots before the change and then i have uh, of course you could imagine that data 2 contains uh, total 2a and 2b of course uh, let's just run the program <laughs> because it's it's really not that complex. Run uh, but so it scans and then it identifies that the absolutely only difference between set one and set two is the address 0219, which is where the camera parameter is stored and the address 07A8, and that is where it's printed on the screen. So 36 is um, six pictures were taken uh, before, and then seven were taken after, which means six here and seven here. And when you print them in ASCII it, or Petsky, it's 36 and 37. So the tool uh, dump diff can detect changes uh, that are real changes and not sort of only fluctuating uh, memory areas um, that are changed during the running of a program. It's quite convenient. Let's say I don't 
and I don't run this on a regular basis, but there are instances where it's really, really tricky to find stuff that changes. And this is a tool that can actually help you with that. So if you ask nicely and spread uh, a link to the video, I would be happy to share uh, the program with you. Just uh, send me a private message uh, because I cannot sort of answer you on YouTube. Uh, preferably go into the Facebook channel, uh, Fairlight Fans, and, and do, a, do a query there, because then I can easily uh, PM you the, uh, the direct link. So that was everything for today. Uh, I'm sorry if this was a bit shallow and uh, possibly not uh, interesting enough for you, but at least I gave you the opportunity of getting one of my tools, if you ask nicely and spread the word. Bye-bye.